All right. Let's get cracking. Good morning, everybody. Steve Atticott, Vice President at Cavion Test Security. Pleased to welcome you today to the next in the Cavion webinar series, Key Security Lessons Learned at this month's ATP Innovations and Testing Conference. And I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague, Dr. John Freemer, as well as Nikki Etchell, Vice President of Program Management from Questar Assessment. Now, what we want to cover today uh, are some of the key lessons, security lessons, that were shared through, next slide please, that were shared through numerous security-related sessions at ATP. Um, and it's important for me to note, the sessions we picked were ones where we were either involved in planning, participating, or just attending. There were over 17 sessions related to security at this year's conference, so we could not share pieces from all of them. This is just uh, the ones that we, where we pulled important uh, takeaways. And before we get going, we want to start with a poll. So if we go to the next slide, please let us know, did you attend this year's conference? Eager to see uh, how many of the folks who are in attendance today were able to attend and how many were not. So I've got, oh wow, almost everyone has voted, so I'm going to close the poll. And John and Nikki looks like about a fifth of the attendees did attend the conference, but 80% or so were unable to. So hopefully we, uh, the lessons we're sharing will, um, will be very helpful for them as they were not able to attend. And now, before I turn things over to Nikki, one last important highlight from the conference, something that we thought was, was monumental. The conference marked Cavion's 10th birthday, 10 years of working with our clients helping to protect their tests. So we were very pleased about that. And uh, now without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Questar's Nikki Etchell. Nikki? Hi, thank you. I um, wanted to um, also reiterate that um, it was really tough to pick those um, uh, things to talk about today because there was so much great discussion um, at the ATP Innovations Conference of those that were also specified security presentations. As you all probably know, there were many, many other presentations that weren't labeled specifically as security, but certainly have implications for all of us in regards to security um, and our assessments. So it was very, very tough. Um, lots of vendors, lots of individual organizations that had just wonderful presentations. So I would highly encourage of those individuals who couldn't make it this year, uh, participation in the conference and in ATP provides just a wealth of information uh, for all of us to utilize. Uh, in our day-to-day -day work, so I would strongly encourage everybody uh, certainly to try and attend. So um, I was the chair of the security committee for ATP in this last year, and I'm actually the co-chair for the incoming year. So I've been involved in a lot of the security discussions, and I'm you know, certainly um, pleased to talk about those a little bit today. I won't be talking about all of our goals for the year in detail today, uh, particularly on a couple that I'm just going to mention quickly here. Um, we uh, wanted to put out their newsletters this year to make sure people that are involved in ATP, um, certainly and some others that aren't entirely involved, can be up to date on things that are going on in the security committee. Um, so we sent out through about two or three of those last year. Only those individuals who request to receive the newsletter actually receive that. So if you're not currently receiving that and you want to know about what's going on in the security committee, opportunities to volunteer and just receive updates and information, my information is included on this at the end of the presentation. You're more than welcome to email me to be involved um, and also to get those uh, newsletters moving forward. Um, also, though I'm not really going to talk about the Live Lab today, um, I just wanted to mention that one of our goals for the year was to sort of spice up the security briefing this year and provide something a little bit different, um, and in this case, a little mini Live Lab in which we could show um, you know, particular concerns around cheating and certainly best practices around proctoring. And I just wanted to mention that we did, in fact, do that at the um, conference, which was a lot of fun and I think a really great session. And I wanted to thank, again, Prometric actually put up the live lab for us and facilitated uh, that part of the session and did a wonderful job. Um, so we were really appreciative of that. Um, if we go to the next slide. I'm going to start by talking about the security survey for 2012. 
The Security Committee has done a survey a number of times around security issues, so this 2012 survey was the most updated survey. Um, we had some goals with the survey in which we wanted to um, broaden the sample that actually responded to the survey. In the past, um, the largest portion of individuals that responded to the security survey were not only just in the certification and licensure area, but predominantly in the IT, certification and licensure area, which is really wonderful and valuable information. But we wanted to make sure that we tried to expand that sample group to get a more uh, broader response on security issues um, uh, in our uh, field, both beyond certification and licensure and even just a broader group within that area. So we actually designed three separate surveys this year. Um, there was a bulk of questions that were similar across all three surveys, but there were individualized questions based on the group. And so we did a, a survey for certification and licensure organizations, one for educational assessment organizations, and one for vendor assessment vendors. We got a really great response. We had 117 organizations that responded. As you can see, that they, they didn't respond equitably. We still got a large number from certification and licensure. We got some nice response from the educational assessment area, and we also got a really nice response from our vendor organizations. We didn't, unfortunately, get a large enough response in some of those in the education and vendor to do sort of in-depth analysis on those smaller numbers as they're not really reliable numbers at that point. Um, so we did end up combining the certification, licensure, and education group for those questions that were the same, so that we could utilize that for analysis. We will, in the upcoming security report, um, be actually noting some compare and contrast in some of the questions to the other groups, you know, somewhat anecdotally since those numbers aren't large but we will be talking about some of the differences we've seen there in the upcoming report. If you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. So just to give you a little bit of a sneak peek, we went through lots of um, data in the actual um, briefing itself, um, but just a little bit of um, information about some of the trends we're seeing is that we did see a wider variety of respondents as we were hoping in the 2012 survey. Um, we did get a lot of certification and licensure. It was about 86% based on those numbers that you saw previously. Um, but it was a wider variety within the certification and licensure um, area. So in, in addition to IT, we got a wider variety of respondents who were in different areas of the development industry beyond just IT. So we were feeling uh, pretty good about that. We noticed in the responses in comparison to previous survey years that the, there is an increased focus on security activities within um, the organizations that responded, which is great. Things like a um, larger number of organizations with key security um, positions that were either solely focused or predominantly focused on the security of their assessments. Um, you know, more emphasis on uh, security communications with personnel and with candidates. Um, more emphasis on, you know, strong um, security policies. So all of those things were a good positive data trend to see. One of the more interesting things that we saw um, was the large percentage of I don't know responses. So for each of our questions, we allowed somebody to say, well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. And it was rather interesting because one of the first questions we asked in the survey is, are you directly involved in the security of your assessment? And predominantly, the answer to that question was yes. So it made it all the more interesting that there was a significant number of questions that had a larger than anticipated number of responses in regards to the I don't know. Um, so that was really interesting, and we'll be looking at that more in the upcoming um, security report. Next slide. Um, other things that we saw, um, again, while we saw a larger percentage of respondents actually saying they had a formal internal security plan that's documented and um, uh, organizationally um, uh, supported, uh, that we also saw something, though, about a gap in the formal external policies. So while they, uh, organizations may have a vendor that has a great security plan or they may have external organizations that they're using that have a security plan, if they do, they don't know it, or if they don't know it, they're not, or if they do know it, they're not in extensive conversation about it. So that was an interesting um, gap to us that the internal plans seem to be more robust in advancing, but actually having those formal conversations with external vendors uh, wasn't moving along as quickly. Um, there also seemed to be a little bit more lack of standard, standardized implementation of the plans. So good, strong security plans were being developed. Um, standardized implementation of those didn't quite seem to be where it, um, we probably all would like it to be yet. And audits of those procedures uh, seemed um, on the smaller end of the scale. So once they were implemented, ensuring that they were being implemented consistently with audits um, uh, wasn't at this point in a high percentage for those people responding to our survey. Um, next slide. There's obviously a lot more um, information to be uh, weaned from the data analysis that we've done on the survey. It was a rather lengthy survey. It was about 50 questions. Um, so we'll be uh, further uh, 
conducting that analysis, and the final report will be available in May on the HP website and certainly in the HP bookstore as well for individuals who are not members. Other things that we worked on this year were the security options document and the enforcement committee's takedown effort. Um, next slide. The security options document actually was um, born out of last year's um, security briefing in which we got a number of comments from people saying what we'd really like to have is a little bit of a, a primer document, a little bit of just an informational document that tells us what our security options are based on the type of assessment model that we're using and the type of delivery channels that we're using. So for example, um, you know, there are different security considerations, uh, benefits and considerations for online testing versus paper-based testing. And there's certainly different um, options available from a security perspective based on the type of exams that you're actually delivering. So um, the document that was put together actually goes through each of those main assessment models and delivery channels and offers up um, sort of features and considerations. Um, and then also goes through about eight different options um, in regards to practices and procedures you can implement for security, things like randomization of your items and your sections within your exam, item pool flooding, um, answer key hold or delayed scoring, fraud detection items, result hold, different things like that. So about eight different options. It described each of those things, offered the pros and cons, as well as general business, business, business considerations, as well as security considerations. And that document is currently available and up on the ACP website. Um, again, it's available free to members and is also in the bookstore as well. Other things that we uh, did this year, just to wrap up that portion of it, next slide please. Um, was our enforcement subcommittee. Um, those of you that are familiar with the ATP Security Committee's activities from last year know that there was an enforcement um, DMC takedown effort last year. Um, and that DMC takedown is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And so what that does is as um, companies actually um, provide a takedown notice to internet service providers, if they've got um, in, uh, copyrighted materials on their website, they have an opportunity actually upon that notification to take it down to avoid liability for infringement. So what we're seeing is um, the group actually wanted to do a group approach to that to put more pressure on internet service providers to actually take down the content um, identified in their um, infringing websites. Um, this year there were six organizations that participated. All um, takedown notices were sent on, on the same day and were sent to six internet service providers that were hosting 17 infringing websites. So um, one got all of the websites removed and approximately 30% of the other websites no longer exist. Um, however, as we all know, things get moved around pretty quickly and easily on the internet. So there's always the concern that you know you take down one area, it just pops up somewhere else. But the hope is that, again, as there are large groups doing that um, in consolidation, that it provides a, uh, a larger message to those ISPs to ensure that they're aware and considering the implication of hosting infringed content. Um, the other goals potentially for the next year are actually going to involve looking at going at um, providing information and, and targeting the payment providers. So hitting these individuals sort of more where it hurts, which is how they're financed. So that's potentially a goal we're looking at for the upcoming year. And lastly, we, um, a group put together the Candidate Rights and Responsibilities Template. One of the things, again, we heard last year is it would be nice for the organization to provide to its members some templates and best practices documents that could be used um, by organizations uh, within their uh, testing programs. Um, interestingly, we wanted to do both um, best practices for proctoring as well as candidate rights and responsibilities, and we really couldn't get organizations to partner with us on the proctoring, um, potentially because of uh, wanting to keep that maybe more proprietary. But we did get a number of uh, organizations, around eight, that participated in the candidate rights and responsibilities. We're currently um, organizing that information into overall template and best practices, and that will also be available in May 2013. I think I don't think I could have said that any faster. So um, that was your um, ATP security briefing update. Um, one of the other ones that I'm going to talk about here quickly, and I certainly can't do it as well as our two presenters uh, that presented this information initially, but wanted to talk about it a little bit because I think it ties in nicely with the work that we're doing in the security committee as well as in the operational best practices group. And that's around conducting effective test security investigations. Uh, ben Manns and Mark Weinstein both presented this information, and their information is up on the screen. Um, moving on to the next slide. This is, again, a much mini version of what was presented. But some of the things that I found most interesting were obviously with, with our enhances in technology. 
uh, particularly in mobile technology. Um, you know, increasing methods and opportunities for cheating uh, just continue to make all of our lives a little bit more difficult um, and something we certainly can't ignore or assume is going to go away. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, we've got to get better at effective test security investigations. Um, and the reason that I actually picked this one as well is just um, personal involvement um, in the industry and seeing some of the strengths and weaknesses around this myself. Um, I found the information in this particularly helpful and wanted to review a little bit here. So core elements around exam integrity, um, you know, protecting your intellectual property, certainly investigating possible breaches. I found it interesting because the comment was protect, investigating all possible breaches. I think that tends to be a little bit difficult. I'm not sure you can even identify all potential breaches, but certainly um, there's enough out there to have to continually take a look at and investigate. And then certainly enforcement of the policies and of rights of your organization uh, when cheating or theft is in fact confirmed. Moving on to the next slide. Um, again, a lot of information here. I thought the interesting pieces around identification and vetting um, tie back a little bit to the ATP security survey as well. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, both in this um, presentation but in many of the presentations about the importance of web monitoring um, and understanding um, how your information is being presented out on the internet, um, what information and particularly proprietary information is being pre presented on the internet. Um, and many people talked about that at the conference and mentioned it um, here or there. We asked about it quite a bit in the survey. And one of the interesting things that I thought was a disconnect is while many of us are talking about it, and some of the service providers mention it as well, when asking the vendors if they saw that as one of the, the highest, you know, or one of the key concerns for their clients, they actually noted it's a piece that they don't hear as much from their clients that they think they should. So I thought that was an interesting um, piece that tied in with this presentation as well. There was conversation about ensuring that you have anonymous reporting available. Um, in addition to those things we all typically think of in regards to um, identification and vetting around forensic analysis, and certainly around monitoring of your administrations, particularly for things like collusion and, and security violations. Um, the vetting process was discussed a, a quite a bit as well. Um, you know, as you have opportunities for anon anonymous reporting, certainly then um, you have the responsibility of vetting those reasonably on what is credible and what doesn't appear to be cre credible, why somebody would report, be reporting the information, and certainly whether or not it's worth um, even conducting an investigation. Um, one of the things, though, we talked about in that, uh, in analyzing, those are the things, uh, collusion, sharing of information, um, inappropriate study techniques, which may be access to um, examination content, um, uh, proprietary content, security violations during the administration, as well as potentially proxy testing. Next slide. So when you're investigating, this is a, again a piece that I keyed on because in the experiences that I've had in the industry, this is the piece that tends to be uh, most difficult for people, particularly in a timely manner. So ensuring that once you um, have concern that a, um, a security violation has taken place, um, whether that's cheating or um, um, actual stealing of content, um, not only does your investigation have to be thorough and, and well thought out, but it has to be enacted quickly. Um, one of the things that um, I've seen is that people are regretting that they no longer had some of the information they really should for their investigation, that they know they didn't actually obtain the infringing materials potentially from the candidate or examinee themselves. Uh, maybe their audio or video records were no longer stored and that was a key piece that they needed moving forward. Um, while they may have forensic data, they may not necessarily have um, snapshots from the exam itself, um, things like that. But um, what those things that need to be identified quickly and all parties involved need to understand why that information has to be saved. Um, and, and the company itself has to have a good understanding of what their policies are around how long you do save that information prior to um, a cheating incident being identified. Next slide. Um, field interviews, I just wanted to mention briefly because I think there's a lot of people that I talk to that have never been involved in a field interview, um, certainly including myself. Um, so I think people don't always view that as the first thing that should be on their list from an investigation standpoint. So I really appreciated this being uh, talked about and discussed, um, particularly the value of talking to individuals who are part of the investigation as they often may not frankly really understand uh, the implications of their actions or the seriousness of that and may offer up information that you wouldn't expect them to that would be helpful in the investigation process. There's a little bit of information that was, um, you know, certainly recommended around having two, two representatives involved um, and certainly not representatives that would be later involved in decisions around sanctions. 
and certainly um, focusing on your nonverbal communication during the field interview process. There was also the note that one would hope that, that people realize that you never should record interviews without permission, um, and certainly even consider whether it makes sense to record at all. Um, and lastly, the piece that I thought was also um, telling is that many people, I think, when they do conduct field interviews, if they do, go right for the throat initially <laughs> to some degree. And there was certainly the discussion around the pyramid approach of that you don't start sort of with your most incriminating information or the, the largest pieces that you want to uh, talk to that interviewee about that you lead into that and have that be the, at the end of your, your conversation. So I thought all of that was really interesting. And, and, and the next um, slide. And lastly, this is one that ties back into me for um, the security policies. Often when we talk to people about do you have you know, formalized security policies, are they implemented, one of the things that doesn't seem to be included in there as frequently is what is the enforcement policy if a security breach is identified. So most people aren't sure what their organizations are willing to do. Is it, are there administrative sanctions, organizational sanctions, is criminal or, or, or civil um, suits uh, even, you know, something that they want to consider, and really even what's the goal? Is the goal to, to just protect your intellectual property? Is it also to ensure you've got strong communication to all your stakeholders, including your candidates, um, about the security of your exams? Those are the pieces that there seems to be the largest gap in the security policies, is what, what is the, um, uh, the enforcement uh, options available to your organization? And are you willing, number one, to enforce those if needed, and are they well communicated, not only to all your stakeholders, but also to your examinees and your candidate population as well. So I thought that was a, a really nice and informative, and there's the information there about um, additional exam integrity conversations if people would like to jump in. And that's it for my slides. Steve, do you have any uh, interest in making a general observation here, or should I launch right into my section? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, you, just thank you very much, Nikki. Great information to share uh, with the audience. And we're now going to move to another session regarding the Handbook of Test Security and turn things over to my colleague, John Freeman. Thank you, Steve. The, this session was an innovation showcase at the conference, and it uh, featured the senior editor for the upcoming handbook, Jim Wallach, and me as a junior editor. And we had three of our authors, Deborah Harris, Bill Hatherill, and David Foster. There are 25 authors, so it was just intended to be a sampling. The handbook is coming out in March of 2013. And it's uh, linked in, in a number of ways to the ATP organization. The sections are certification, licensure, clinical, educational, industrial, organizational. I think if you're working in uh, high stakes testing, as uh, many of you on this call surely are, somebody in your organization needs to get a copy of this book when it comes out. Uh, none of us are getting royalties from it, so I don't have to feel uh, that it's unseemly for, for me to make that recommendation. All of the editors and authors have agreed to donate any royalties to the NCME. But it is the nature of the book is such, as I hope you will conclude, not just from what I say, but as you learn more about it, is such that you want to have it. Next slide. So the, the uh, kind of one of the structuring elements of the book is to bring together the psychometric types and policymakers across uh, academic and uh, testing organizations. And I think we've done a good job of that to address best practice for test design and analysis of how to uh, uh, find security vulnerabilities and do something about it. So we have quite a bit on cheating prevention and also on cheating detection. Then we go over a number of actual cases where there were violations, what uh, we've learned from that, and, and the security initiatives, activities that different organizations have tried in order to enhance security and the fate of those activities. Uh, I, next slide. The handbook lists 
five overall takeaways from the book of what is covered in the different sections that seem to us as authors and editors worth noting. One is that uh, there are security vulnerabilities identified for all genres of testing. It isn't going to solve the problem to go to computer adaptive testing from paper and pencil. It's just going to change it. That security planning is critical, uh, not just talking about it, but writing it down, getting it reviewed, and then, as was mentioned by Nikki, doing it. It's not enough to have a plan. You have to do it. We have quite a number of uh, what we call practical and proven prevention and detection strategies summarized, and we have case studies of breaches, how they were detected, what action was taken, and then the lessons we've drawn from that. Next slide. I don't mind making predictions myself, because so what if you're wrong, right? Uh, mostly people won't remember what you said, and it will be years before they really figure it out. So uh, I'm pretty comfortable making predictions. And these five predictions are ones that are in my uh, closing chapter in the book. Uh, it will no longer be possible to run a serious program without doing cheating detection statistical analysis. That's going to become the standard, just the way we do reliability, item quality, uh, and exposure type things. Computer-based testing will increasingly become the norm. It's already true in much of certification licensure. Not so much true in education, but that's about to change. Technology developments will be critically important to test security, and programs will continue to become more and more international different contributors from different countries. And the title, uh, Test Security Manager, or Director, or VP, Specialist, whatever, will increasingly become a recognized and valued position. Moving to the next slide and a new topic. Steve, do you want to tell them how they could do questions? Certainly. So we've, we've covered three sessions so far. Uh, if you have a question in the little uh, system cockpit on your screen, you'll see an area where you can actually write and submit a question, and we will uh, strive to answer that in a timely manner. Um, and without, I, I see that we've got one comment, but I think we'll wait till the end for that. <clears throat> okay, Let's and those things can be, can be saved, and we'll address them either in the call or following. Uh, this next session I'm going to talk about is data forensic black box. Dennis Maines. John, I think we lost you. Yeah. We lost Skyler? No, we lost you. Okay, there you are. We couldn't hear you. So let me tell you what's on the next slide while we're figuring out how to get it up there. Uh, I did a session, there it is, at, the, uh, at our uh, opening the black box linking data forensics and testing to other applications of forensics, cyber forensics, financial forensics. And these seem to me the way that you can tell that a forensics approach is maturing instead of becoming mainstream. There are explicit standards. There are one or more associations devoted to that approach. There are formal training programs, regular conferences, one or more journals, body of published literature, and regular positions in many agencies and companies. My own evaluation, you've even picked up some of that from uh, on Nikki's uh, earlier presentation, we're on that track. Data forensics and testing is becoming a recognized area that's developing all of the things that are listed here. It's just that we're fairly early on in the process. Next slide. Uh, within our opening the black box, 
Dennis Maines laid out, which he's done on a number of occasions, what are the things that one looks at when performing data forensics, uh, statistical analyses for a testing program? And these are in some ways listed in importance and value. Uh, similarity, uh, person to person, looking for an unusual number of exactly the same answer, not just answering the same questions right and wrong, but choosing the same answer when you get it wrong. Uh, that's probably, if you could only do one thing, you would do that. And aberrance, which is a lack of a, a, a sensible pattern. Why would you answer the hard questions correctly while missing the easy ones? Well, maybe because someone gave you the hard questions or helped you on them, assuming you could do the easy ones on your own, but you didn't do that well. Uh, gains or drops, uh, score changes over time when you have multiple uh, bits of information. This is very valuable in the educational setting with state assessment, looking at schools and classes and so on. Erasures, uh, and what you're looking for is unusual patterns, such as almost always changing a wrong to a right answer. On average, if you look at all your wrong answers and decide to make a change, if you just look at the wrong answers, you, you're probably going to improve overall, but if it's a four choice question, you still only have one chance in three of getting the right answer. And sometimes you find 80 to 90% or more of changes are all wrong to right. That doesn't happen naturally. Something uh, intervened. Uh, fast responding means super fast. You couldn't possibly have read the questions and answered them. So you were working from a key or someone was changing them for you in a computer environment. And then finally, uh, looking at the background information about the uh, performance and uh, seeing whether somehow the person has the same email and home address and other types of shared information. So let's move from that, I think, uh, to the next slide and another poll. Steve, you want to yeah. pick that up? Absolutely, John. So I'm going to launch a poll. and. The, the question is a little bit different than what we had talked about before. The question is, we carry out data forensics. Our program carries out some sort of statistical analysis on our exams always, sometimes, rarely, or never. And so we're seeing that people are actively responding. And John, while we wait, there was a question about the use of data forensics. Do you think the use of these indices will increase in the future to take cheaters to task? So I, I got, uh, will it increase in the future? But I missed the well, take cheaters to task. What's the question? The question is, will they be used to take cheaters to task, to actually penalize cheaters? Yes, in a lot of situations they will, although our approach at Tavion, certainly my approach is, your goal is fairness and validity. So if you could simply get the behavior to stop, don't be prosecuted. Don't think you have to find every last person who misbehaved. If that's your goal, you're going to burn a lot of energy doing that, and you may not get as far as you'd like to in, in having that behavior go away. I hope that's not counterintuitive, but I've thought a lot about that, and I think fairness and validity, not punishing every last person should be a goal. So I've just closed the slide. Thank you for that response, John. And, and this is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, gratified to see that a, a third of the programs in attendance are always running statistical analyses. That's up from what we saw even a year ago. Um, and just one last comment, John. People are asking if these slides will be available after the session. And yes, we'll have the slides available as well as a recording of the session. So uh, that will be available for you to disseminate and review as you'd like. So let's, uh, let's keep going. So the next session was a competition, and I list the names, but you can look at them later. Let's jump on to the content. They're great people. They did such a good job. Uh, Dennis Maines posed a problem, threw it out into the ether, and three teams responded. Uh, the problem was a test preparation course 
had harvested items, stolen items from the pool of a testing agency, imputed, made up the key because they didn't have a key, and then distributed the content and key prior to testing. The test program manager reviews the score results, and one of the ways they were arrayed for the competing teams was as histograms, and there's this bizarre outcome of a huge concentration of scores, 95% correct. Uh, next slide. So what the teams got was a live data set uh, with an illustration of the problem. There were, out of uh, 387 test takers, there were 32 identical tests with a score of 95% in this 100 item test. And the probability of that outcome was one in four trillion. So people sometimes ask me, does data forensics sometimes absolutely show there was cheating? Yes, in this instance. Or some catastrophic error in the recording of the data and its analysis. And this data was worked over enough, that wasn't it. The okay, next slide. So these three teams working independently and with some restraints, because they just they had the data and they had this background. They didn't have item and test analysis data. They didn't have past history of any of the test takers. They just had to work within the data sets that they got. And there were some things they all did the same. They looked at test scores. They made a variety of different histograms. They made a judgment of what that key must have said that they were working from. That would lead, in the case of uh, a set of questions all choosing exactly the wrong answer. You might as well write at the bottom of your answer sheet or type in after you leave the term, just before you leave the terminal. And by the way, I cheated on this test. And then they looked at individual item performance, they split up the test takers and the items in various ways, each of the three teams. But there were differences across the teams in the types of classification rules and models that they used to come to their conclusion about how much cheating, who did it, how many items were compromised. And the, the three teams uh, varied in how much confidence they had in their ability to identify which test takers were involved. And also, two of them use IRT models, one not. Dennis makes the note that maybe with disclosed test content, that might be such a contaminating effect that IRT models uh, may not apply. Then the third and last slide in this set, The, the overview of all of the work uh, done by uh, Dennis Maines is that it's not obvious what the optimal solution is. So he didn't tell them who won, or, or any, but that wouldn't be like him at all anyway. But that several models can be used, in this case were used. This is a harder problem maybe than one would ordinarily find in theft of a pool because the test was not composed only from that pool. So only um, some items and keys were compromised. And in this particular case, the, uh, the assumed keys were actually what all the students who misbehaved used. So they all did exactly what was in the key that was given to them by the miscreants. And Dennis, as a researcher, naturally thinks that more research is needed. Uh, one line of research is figuring out how to tell what was the key if there is a bad key, if, there, if there's an illegal key out there, how can you tell what's on that key? And he thinks we need more use of Bayesian approaches where you bring other information into the picture and trying to figure out what it was that went wrong. And then he simply makes the observation that this is worth investing in and figuring out what to do because harvesting our items and disclosing them is one of the worst things that can happen. Uh, much more problematical than two or three people cheating together. You lose your pool, and it's your intellectual property that permits you to run your program and have it be fair and valid. So that's the last of my sessions, and ready to move on. Steve, do you have uh, anything else to say, or should we just launch? Let's keep going, but I think, aren't you doing tell it to the judge? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. That's why you're part of the reason you're on this, Steve, is to keep me honest. <laughs> That's right, doctor. I am doing tell it to the judge, so, and those are the people. You can look up their names in uh, 
at your leisure. Let's go on to the next one. And it was a courtroom environment, and Steve was part of it. I think you were the judge, Steve. And the setting is there's a global financial certification program. You're new at data forensics, found some strange results. Test program manager looked into it, recommended action, and the ethics board votes to certify the candidate, and the candidate takes them to court. And that was really something, because I think they gave the candidate my name. So they kept talking about the aggrieved John Freeman unjustly uh, treated. So I only cut part of the session, but that was fun. So what were the conclusions that the whole group drew from that um, session that they passed on to the audience? Next slide. Get an expert who's really an expert, because they're going to be rigorously cross examine, make sure they use methodology that's been thoroughly tried. Don't over-report. Report fairly. Follow the procedures that you set up and be objective at every stage. Don't just say things that you think might support your case if you can't really back them up. There are only reasonable conclusions. Uh, next slide. Your, your teacher, ha your expert has to be a teacher and storyteller. They have to walk in and sit in that courtroom and tell a story that's very believable and evidence-based. Make sure that you've given your expert all of the facts, including uh, any type of information that might bear on the instance, because if you don't use it, the other side will. And then make sure that absolutely everything that you said in your candidate agreement uh, you followed uh, reasonably in good faith and uh, they didn't put this as a conclusion but listening to them don't go lightly into a court setting uh, try to achieve your goals if you can short of the courtroom and uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money and you need to back and be prepared to devote time and energy to it now Steve I think I really am through my section you are through, and I'm going to launch a third poll. And this is interesting. The session was very well attended, and so I'm curious to see, have any of you out there had decisions uh, that you've made regarding your test, regarding candidates challenged in court? Have anyone faced a situation where someone has lawyered up and you're forced to defend the decision you made? So we'll just pause for a couple of seconds. I can see that people are actively responding. And while we've got a significant portion of the attendees, oh, just a five seconds more, and I'll close this up. Looks like a fifth of the attendees have encountered courtroom situations, and four-fifths, or 80%, have not. So, pretty interesting info. Uh, at this point, we're going to turn things back to Nikki, and she's going to share her takeaways from another session on balancing security and accessibility. Nikki? Thank you. And, and this one I, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on because I know we're getting late now and I want to leave time for questions. But this came up um, certainly in our security briefing. Um, Cheryl and Martha, as you can see, there uh, made this presentation. If you can go to the next slide. They had a lot of questions for us in our security briefing around um, what are we considering from a security perspective in regards to accessibility, um, particularly for um, examinees and students with disabilities as well as, well as, as English language learners or indiv individuals where um, English is not their first language, but that is the language of the test that they're taking. Clearly, there's different accessibility issues um, and security issues, uh, depending on if you're providing a paper-based exam or a computer-based exam. But regardless, you know, the whole uh, concern, and I think legitimately so, is you know, are we considering in our security processes um, that students with um, these accessibility issues could unintentionally be denied meaningful access to the exams based on the security protocol. So it's an interesting balance to have to make. We all want to ensure fairness to all candidates um, and also need to ensure the security of the examination process. So it's an interesting um, set of considerations to be looked at and one that 
um, I would say uh, from a uh, survey standpoint and in discussions we've had with people is again tends to be one of those that isn't the most prominent prominent discussion at the table which is why I wanted to just highlight it here and mention it as I think we're going to be focusing on that a little bit more in our upcoming year from the Security Committee perspective. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So there's different things to be thinking about. Again, this varies by um, type of industry, so certification licensure versus K-12, through for example. Um, but there's things to be considering in regards to accommodations, um, things around visual cues for um, students, for example, in the K-12. through Sometimes um, accommodations require um, or request um, certain potential symbols, arrows, um, stop signs, you know, things like that within the exam, maybe more prominently than you do in a typical exam. There's sometimes requests come in for specific teacher highlighting of directions or keywords and things like that, which again is a pretty significant consideration both from a fairness and um, security standpoint. Um, there's also issues of accessibility software that can be used that certainly open up um, security considerations. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide for me. Things to be thinking about and ones that we've actually had pretty lengthy discussions at this point in the Operational Best Practices Committee. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but there's a new version of the Operational Best Practices that you'll see on the next slide coming out. It's out for public comment now from the Association of Self-Publishers. There's a lot of emphasis in this version on um, technology-based assessments as well as security and accessibility. There was a lot of updates and enhancements to those sections. And one of the things that discussed in there, and one of the things that I've seen in regards to working with various um, organizations within the industry, is even those that have a more formalized and more structured security guidelines than they've had in the past, as we stated earlier from the, from the survey results, um, those guidelines don't always have um, significant um, reference to um, maintaining your security in regards to um, approved accommodations. So when you've got instances, for example, um, where you have to have an administrator that has previous access to the examination content prior to the live distribution of the exam, and that may be because um, they are being asked to emphasize certain directions and certain words, so they need to see that ahead of time. It may be because somebody who is doing in a, in a language setting, a translator might need access to it ahead of time. That comes with it, of course, um, significant security issues that need to be addressed. And while we're seeing um, a great enhancement in the number of um, security documentations, document, the documentation for security protocols that are being developed, we're not necessarily seeing them focus um, as much on uh, the security concerns around those accommodations. And not surprisingly, then your test security agreements aren't also in alignment. So for example, um, even those organizations who may have adjusted their guidelines to clearly spell out security that should be in place around these special accommodations, they may not, for example, have updated these security agreements that their administrators, proctors, uh, and or examinees have to sign. So their examinees or their proctors are signing documents saying that they won't, for example, access content prior to the administration, and then they're having to do that for the accommodation, and then those documents therefore don't match. So there's considerations around those pieces as well, as uh, well as obviously considerations for a student's individualized education program or students with limited English proficiency, but also just around the training. Again, where we do see some pretty strong training within particular organizations within the industry, there's training particularly around standardized administration processes. Um, unlike vendor organizations uh, who have um, test centers where they've got very strong protocols for both standardized and accommodated testing. When you get into other organizations where maybe it's not within a, a test center um, and you've got different personnel and involved in that administration, often the focus is on that standardized administration and the training doesn't necessarily take into account, at least at maybe the degree that it should, the security training around those accommodated pieces. Um, with that obviously comes protocols for that access and distribution piece that we've talked about. When you're distributing, for example, paper-based exams to particular students or examinees based on their accommodations, um, and it's a technology-based exam, certainly need to have protocols around how you, 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 how you protect that physical content uh, when it's an exception, for example, rather than the rule. Um, next slide. So, you know, a few resources that were mentioned in the presentation, as we said, the operational best practices um, that's noted there is currently under revisement and out for public con uh, comment, so that will, new version of that will be out soon. Obviously, other um, references have been mentioned today as well. 
So I think there's a lot of good stuff out there. I do think that probably raising the level of the discussion around the security and accessibility um, is a great uh, focus to have. And I think from the security committee standpoint, we'll be considering what we want to do with that in the next year as well. So just one of the reasons I wanted to mention that in our review. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. So we now want to open things up for questions. As if you've attended before, we always strive to keep these under an hour. So we've got just a few minutes for some questions. Um, I see that there's one regarding data forensics. And the question is, as exam data forensics become more mainstream, will invalidating scores uh, versus sanctioning candidates be the best way to scale to thwart the cheating threat? So invalidation versus sanctions. Nikki, any reactions there? Or John? Well, I think it's interesting. In the um, subcommittee group that we had that dealt with security options by delivery model and, and channel, uh, assessment model and delivery channel, there was um, a good deal of, of um, spirited discussion around the concept of having both your typical sort of uh, cut score for an exam and also in essence your, um, uh, your, your forensic uh, cut score as well. So that during the exam itself, um, you know, that proactive evalu data forensic evalu evaluation going on while the exam is being administered and actually the discussion around having both sort of the content knowledge cut score as well as the integrity cut score. And that was a really interesting one. The conversation was around that's where we're potentially going. Um, and why people want to look at results hold, for example, not providing instant access to scores anymore until those can be evaluated. Um, but there's a lot of heated debate around that, and I think that certainly a lot of discussion um, from a candidate fairness standpoint, from a security standpoint, from a legal liability standpoint, I think it's a pretty hot topic um, and one that I think we're going to see a lot more discussion about in the upcoming year. But, I, but we did mention it in the document that some people are going in that direction. Um, but I think it has, you know, pretty substantial implications. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. You know, I'm familiar, we work with uh, some state departments of education that are using statistical analysis to invalidate scores. And in those situations, we're very careful to not use the C word. We're not accusing anyone of cheating. We're not focused on the behavior of a candidate or student. We're focused on the trustworthiness of the result. So when a particular individual's results are beyond a very conservative threshold, that person's score is invalidated and welcomed to retest. And, uh, and that has been, that's proven to be a very effective way to begin to manage some of the security risks in those situations. So I hope that answers that question. Um, we've got another one related to online and remote proctoring. And um, I think rather than address that one right now, in April, Caveon CEO, Dr. David Foster, is going to be conducting a webinar on different online and remote proctoring technologies for use in high stakes tests. So uh, I may just uh, ask for um, some patience in responding to that. Um, here is a question. This is probably best suited for John. John, what are you hearing about states putting into effect legislation making test cheating a criminal act for teachers, administrators, and proctors? One of the places that came up was in New York State, where when they went, went to act on the uh, student who was taking act assessment and SATs for other students, uh, the district attorney in, I guess it's Nassau County, uh, found there was no law that had to make cheating a crime, so they had to get on the case and they couldn't retroactively apply it, but the student was paid for his activities, they were able to go after him on um, that was a fraudulent activity involving exchange of money. I, I hear it. I'm sorry, John, are you still there? 
takes them a while for that to move through the system, but there's so much attention to the problems with cheating, undermining the value of scores that I expect to see more of it. Some instances it already exists. Uh, in South Carolina, all irregularities are reported to the law enforcement branch automatically. Unfortunately, the law enforcement branch listens to the Department of Education and doesn't try to investigate all of them because some of them are pretty harmless. They're just going to go off to the ones that matter. And another issue they have to face is how big a crime is it? Is it a misdemeanor? Is it a felony? If it's a misdemeanor, most often with all the other crimes to be investigated, no one will pay any attention to it, whether it's on the books or not. There's, uh, so we're running out of time. There's one last question from an individual in higher ed wondering what, where can he find resources that will help uh, in approaching faculty to get them to incorporate some of these security practices into their exams. Uh, seems like the National Collegiate Test Association could be a resource. Is, is it, would you direct someone there, John? I would. And uh, looking at our uh, web page and blogs, uh, we try to cover whatever people are interested in. So we'll probably have one on that before long now that it's been posed as a question to us. Great. Well, uh, without further ado, let's, let's move to the next slide. Um, we just want to make sure people are aware of some of the resources that are available to them. Uh, CCSSO and ATP are releasing the next iteration of operational best practices for high stakes test programs. Those are being released in June. Nikki has talked about the ATP Security Committee and a number of wonderful resources there and lots of opportunities for volunteer engagement where you can collaborate with, with like-minded peers. Uh, at Caveat on our website, we try to share useful information through these webinars as well as on weekly blogs. They are not commercials about our services. We're simply trying, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're trying to share what we've learned through hundreds of engagements to help you better protect your program. And uh, as Nikki indicated, NCME has some new guidelines, and CCSSO has just produced a TILSA, which is Technical Innovations in Large Scale Assessment Guidebook for State Assessment Directors. So, so lots of conversation, lots of things afoot regarding security. Um, one last slide, if uh, Skylar, go forward. We'd love to just gain your feedback on how often you've attended these webinars. And please, uh, when we follow up with emails, if you have any ideas or tips that would be uh, helpful in making these more effective, more useful, new ideas, things that you'd like to see covered, we're happy to try to uh, uh, implement some of those recommendations. So looks like a number of folks have, uh, have responded. I'll close this up in just a minute so we can get things buttoned up. But um, looks like 25% are our first timers. Welcome, thank you. 42% have attended four or so. 13% um, have attended five or more, and 20% attend everyone they, they're able to. So we thank you very much for that. Um, next slide, please. Just as I mentioned, it's our 10th birthday. Here's a link to a video, kind of a walk through the last 10 years with Cavion invite you to take a look at it. We think it's kind of fun. I think the best part is uh, looking at caveat, pictures of Caveon's leaders when we're 10 years old. So um, that, with that, thank you all very much. Hope this has been a productive session for you. Both of our presenters, Nikki and John, are eager to uh, respond to any questions that were not addressed. And again, here are some ways to engage with us through social media.
Thank you all very much. Oh, and I get a happy birthday wish from somebody. That's very nice, yes. Um, thank you all. Have a wonderful day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month for the next in the Caveon webinar series. Stay tuned for details on that.